Man, what is happening, my YouTube family? Of course, it is your boy, Be New. I'm coming at you on this Thursday. And first and foremost, as always, just want to send out positive vibrations and vibes and blessings to anybody who could be listening. Now, with all that being said, we do know that the playoffs are in full of fitness and going on. And there's been some great playoffs. And, you know, a lot of people just haven't been enjoying it like they should be because some of their favorite players aren't in it. You all know my favorite player, Be and LeBron James, of course, did not make it, but that doesn't mean the playoffs have not been exciting. And for those who are big Kevin Durant fans, of course, we all know what happened with him and a lot of people tuned out. But if you're smart and you love the NBA like I love the NBA, then I hope you've been tuning in and partaking of all of these games because they have been truly fantastic. And speaking of truly fantastic games, uh, you know, I had a good day yesterday on FanDuel as far as collecting on some money. I get into more of that a little bit later, especially if we want to do some lines and things like that. But uh, let's just talk about the games yesterday. So really, I'm going to probably touch on both games. And I think I'm going to start, of course, with the game that came on first was the Milwaukee Bucks and uh, the Boston Celtics. And that was a hell of a game. I will say, uh, you know, it was just kind of a back and forth battle, something that, you know, that you'd like to see in the playoffs. Uh, you know, that, that game five is always, to me, the most important game of the series. Uh, a lot of times, especially when the teams are tied up two to two, because we all know what the record is and what the statistics is of a team. Once they go up three to two, then, then they have, a, I think, a 75% or more chance of closing out the series. And a lot of people thought, on yesterday while watching the game that the uh, Boston Celtics had Milwaukee right where they wanted them, uh, you know, that they were at home, uh, they were going to do their thing, and of course when Tatum, I want to say, with four or five minutes left, they was up by maybe 12, I think, when Tatum went in for that dunk, and I mean, it was a nice dunk, he blew by his man, and of course dunked right on top of his head, and we thinking oh yeah, this is it and, you know, a lot of people even tweeted out and people on Facebook or whatever social media platform you was on talking about, oh, yeah, it's over with, Celtics, whatever. And, of course, we all know. And speaking of which, Giannis Odetokounmpo was able to pull off on yesterday, which I wouldn't even give him the game ball. You know, even though without his 40 points, they wouldn't be where they were. But in the crucial moments, I'd have to give that game ball to none other than Drew Holiday because of the way Drew Holiday stepped up. Uh, he hit a, he hit a big three-point shot down the stretch. Uh, but, of course, Giannis' three-point shot, I think, was the biggest one because, of course, they were down by six. And here it is, Giannis, who shot, what, 10 or 11 percent the entire playoffs. Uh, not the entire playoffs, but in this series from three, has shot it terrible. And a lot of people have been telling him, look, man, just chill, stop shooting the three, just dominate on the inside. And lo and behold, it's a good thing he had that heart. And you got to say that Giannis does indeed have a clutch gene because we even saw the week before the end of the season when Milwaukee played Brooklyn. And that's what made me say that Giannis should have been the MVP because to me last night, the MVP was Giannis Odetokounmpo. Uh, I think that was the winner last night. And because, I mean, I think he should have been the winner of the, uh, he should have been the winner of the MVP because we see where Jokic is right now and we see what Giannis is doing. And we see what Giannis is doing without the likes of a Chris Middleton. Uh, Chris Middleton not even playing. And you know that Chris Middleton has been deemed the closer uh, for the Milwaukee Bucks, been deemed the closer for Milwaukee because they say, well, Giannis can hit free throws, Giannis can't hit threes, even though that's not the same anymore. So to me, I think I think Milwaukee Bucks have three closers they can depend on. And whatever the play calls for and the situation calls for, they are capable of finishing. That's when they had Chris, a healthy Chris Middleton, of course. Now, with that being said, I do want to say that, you know, I would pick them at if they can get past the Celtics. I'm not saying that series is over just yet. It depends on how much heart Boston come out with because the closeout game is the hardest game. Uh, it depends on how much heart Boston come out with, but I dare say that the Milwaukee Bucks will be back-to-back -back champions because I think they would demolish a, uh, a Golden State. I think that they would go neck and neck with Phoenix like they did last year in a rematch, but I think ultimately would probably win that series in six games if I had to put money on it. And unfortunately, the, the Memphis Grizzlies, who I really picked to win it all here just a couple of weeks ago, of course, with the injury to John Morant, which we're not making any excuses for that, but with the injury to John Morant, uh, I don't 
even and I'm gonna talk about that series in just a minute because I still think Memphis can pull that off and I got a lot to say about that as y'all probably already know especially uh, those returning uh, viewers who come to this channel and understand, you know, it's all about Tennessee for me, born and raised, and I love Bill Street Blue, and I do love my Grizzly best, but I'm not gonna sit up here and be biased. I'm gonna call things like I is, like like they are, and do the best I can to uh, analyze, give a fair analysis of what it has taken place. So before I get into that, like I was saying, with the Milwaukee game, man, we got to talk about really not the person who won the game for them, but the person who lost the game for them. And the person who lost the game for them was none other than Marcus. He has a middle name, his new middle name. Now it's Ain't Too. Yeah, for those that ain't figured it out yet, that's Marcus Ain't Too Smart. Cause Marcus Ain't Too Smart is the one who blew the game for them last night. He basically uh, on the rebound where Porter's got the put back from the free throw. Uh, jumps into Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown really had the rebound secure. Now, I will say it is the playoffs. It's intense, and you're trying to fight to get every ball, so I'm sure he didn't see him, but both of them fighting for the ball. The last thing you need to do, you need to pay attention uh, to your surroundings. I mean, that is your own player that you're jumping into and causing him not to have the ball. So, what I'm trying to say is, man, uh, you know, Marcus Smart kind of blew that game for them. If you really think about it down the stretch, uh, you got to think about that play. Uh, then the play at the end of the game, not when he got stripped at the end when they was down by three, when he had Tatum open and possibly could have got it to him, but the play before that, when he thought he was, hot damn it, uh, James Harden or Kobe or whoever he thought he was when he was went baseline, which he actually made a good play, and he hung in the air, and you think he was going to make that shot, but then out of nowhere, Drew Holiday comes over, blocks his shot, and to add insult to injury, takes it and throws the ball off his chest. <laughs> like, I'm, that's not funny, you know what I'm saying? Especially if you're a Boston fan, I apologize for laughing, but damn, man, that's just really adding insult to injury that you block the man's shot, then throw the ball off his chest out of bounds so you can maintain possession and go down here and win the game. So now that Milwaukee is up 3-2, to two, uh, and I'm going to tell you how I won money because I, I, both of these games are too close for me to call before the game. Except for the Grizzlies, they was disrespecting, giving them too many points when I knew it would be a close game. But these other games too close to call. I like to go ahead and do the live betting. And at one point, they was giving Milwaukee like eight and a half, I think, in the fourth quarter. And I said, I'm going to jump on this because I know they're going to make a run and make it closer. I wasn't sure if they were going to win, but I knew they was. So I went ahead and dropped the bread down. And, of course, it was a nice, good return for your boy. And... Uh, you know, I, I suggest people to do that if you want to make a little extra money. I mean, it's not that hard to me. Live betting, you can kind of feel which way the game is going. You know, you, you understand what I'm saying? But anyway, uh, where I really think that this game was won for Milwaukee and why I think they will ultimately close out this series, I think in six. Put in the comments below if you think who will win uh, game six for Milwaukee. And will Milwaukee be able to close it out? Will the Bucks and Giannis be able to close it out? They will be at home, so I think the crowd will be raucous and ready because they don't want to go to Boston for a Game 7 because you know how TD Gardens will get in a Game 7. But where they ultimately lost the game to me was on the offensive, uh, was really on the, on the offensive end of the game by them really just giving away all, really just giving away so many points, especially off the turnovers. You know, they turnovers, even it's about even, they had 13 turnovers to their 10, the rebounding, really, Boston really uh, out-rebounded them, ultimately, but on the offensive boards, they just couldn't be stopped. Milwaukee had way too many second chance opportunities, uh, you know, and this is one thing, if you look at it from an analytics standpoint, because for the game, Milwaukee shot 51%, to Boston, 43% is why they won. But from three, they shot uh, 32%, 10 out of 31, uh, which was good enough. They didn't take a whole lot of threes, which I think is good because you have to value each possession, especially in these playoffs. So just want to give big ups to Milwaukee Bucks for winning that. And if you skipped ahead because you didn't want to hear that and you want to just go ahead and listen to the Memphis Grizzlies, we'll get into that because Memphis Grizzlies on yesterday totally annihilated Golden State Warriors. And what I mean by annihilated the Golden State Warriors, I really mean annihilated them 
the first quarter was close, but after that, Memphis went on like a 90 to 40 run, something crazy. Like they was up by like 50 points at one time. You know, everybody was saying, whoop that trick, whoop that trick. Now we know that Steph Curry before the game, when they asked him about the game plan, what was that game plan? He thought that he would make a joke in the Schneid remark and say, whoop that trick was the game plan. But he ultimately found out that he was the trick that was getting whooped. That's what he ultimately found out. And Draymond Green, while they was playing whoop that trick, he wanted to wave the towel around. Let me tell y'all something. I know points don't carry over. And you can erase something and you can correct mistakes. But you got to look at the last game without John Morant. The last game was very close. And if it wasn't for Steph Curry, and I know y'all might change the channel, right? Especially Golden State fans when I say this. But hear me out on this and I'll drop a whole separate video. Or I'll put it right here. Let me move to the side. I'm going to go back and edit this junk and put it right to the side of the worst flopping job ever done by Steph Curry. Because we all know that Memphis was up. Uh, Memphis was down by one with 20-something seconds left. Bain was putting the put back in. I mean, barely brushed, brushed up against the Steph Curry, if he even touched him at all. And this man flew across the air uh, uh, eight feet to get the foul call to go to the penalty, go hit a couple of free throws. And all you did was step up and hit free throws in one. It's not like you hit a clutch shot, a three, was doing something because you was you was ice cold, bro, when it came time for it. But at the end of the day, you flopped, you did what you had to do, you went to the line, and you won that game uh, by hitting those free throws. But I don't want to dwell too much on that game, but I hate I didn't do a video on it, so I do want to speak on it for just a second because also, and I'm talking about game four, y'all, not game five. Also, this was at Golden State. Uh, when I'm talking about that flop, which if you can see it, it's right here. I'm putting it up right here. I'm gonna try to loop it. I don't know what the hell I be doing. Y'all y'all know I'm old, so I'm doing the best I can, but y'all probably all saw it. Put in the comments if you agree if there was a flop. Put in the comments if you agree if this right here is a flop, because I'm telling you it is. So now, uh, what really made a mistake in that game is when the charge and foul, they called Wiggins came in. The Grizzlies was up by eight, and Wiggins came in in charge but yet they they called it a blocking foul and gave him an and one which cut it from eight to five where i think coach uh the coach of the grizzlies should have uh challenged that which he kept a challenge in his pocket and never used i don't know why he didn't use it on the step curry flop either but he could have challenged that and then they would have reversed it even the commentators and everybody agreed that you know andrew wiggins lowered his shoulder into him and charged so Memphis would have had the ball up by eight with the ball back, even though that was just with the last minute of the, of the third quarter. But that allowed them to get momentum, cutting it to five. Memphis missing that shot. We all know after that they cut it down to three, and the rest is history. But like I said, not focusing on that game, more focusing on last night. Now we see Memphis won 134 to 95, and where they really killed them at was spreading the ball around. And I will say this, a lot of people think, well, Memphis Grizzlies are better with, without John Morant. I think you're crazy if you believe that. Uh, we know what their record was, and we know they had we had a large sample size without him, and that they beat a lot of good teams or whatever. But they're still capable of beating those same teams with John Morant. And the reason why I say that is when you get into a battle like the battle they had the other night, where they ultimately lost by the three points, uh, that's a game you would have needed John Morant in the clutch because he does have that clutch chain and he's ready and he can break down the defense. He puts a lot of pressure on the defense at any time, and they still got to learn how to jail. This is a very young team. You're talking about a 21-year-old John Morant, a 20-year-old uh, Desmond Bain, a 21-year-old 20, uh, 20 Jaron Jackson Jr. You're talking about don't forget Memphis has the youngest team in the league but they have the fastest pace team in the league and that's why they're still good even without John Morant because they move the ball they get up and down the court. This is not the Memphis Grizzlies of the old days of the grid and grind even though they do get out there defensively and I will say even though I hate Dylan Brooks in the game with his terrible shooting selection and not able to hit shot at a pathetic clip I will say that his defense is excellent when he's on the switch whether he's on Clay Thompson uh, Steph he plays excellent defense. Uh, Desmond Bain has done the same as far as the defense that he's played on uh, both Steph Curry and Clay Thompson himself. Um, I just see that this series uh, could still go seven. I don't think the Warriors feel like what the Warriors did at the game uh, four as they thought they won just by going up three to one. But they must have forgot they the ones who blow three one leads. So when they did all that celebrating and Steph on the flex and Draymond and y'all act like y'all really did something because they were, let's not forget, they was losing that game the whole time by 10 points. They didn't get their first lead to under one minute left in the game. I'm talking about game four, not game five yesterday. So 
if they if they were only winning and took the lead at the end, now you flexing and did all that. You think Memphis didn't notice that? Man, they not scared. That's the thing. They a young team. They not scared. And just seeing Josh celebrating with his teammates is great because you see he's not a hater. You got some players out who they make it all about them. So they feel like, uh, you know, everything is all about them. And since uh, uh, they don't, I'm not saying they don't want their team to do good, but they like, damn, it's kind of like when a backup quarterback come in for the quarterback. You know, that quarterback might be over there acting like he's supporting them, but we all know at the end of the day, man, he, he don't want that quarterback to do too good because he's going to take his spot. You understand what I'm saying? But uh, where Memphis really killed Golden State, I think is what's going to hurt Golden State, is the boards, man. They had 18 offensive rebounds to four. Uh, the use of Steven Adams, I'm telling you what, Steven Adams is really getting it in right about now. Uh, I mean, even his playmaking uh, on the defensive end, as far as the perimeter, when he get caught on the switch, he get caught on the switch, I'm telling you. He, Steph didn't score on him not one time, and even Steph should easily be able to blow by him, but his lateral movement wasn't that bad to where he could still get help, uh, you know, by the time Steph blow by him where the help can come, and then you can still have somebody close out to the weak side if if he decided to kick it to the corner for a three. So, you know, with all that being said, I think Steven Adams was a big plus to the team. I don't think they have an answer for him. There's really nobody who can guard him, even though he only has seven points, but he's out there more so for rebounding and for setting screens and uh, just doing all the things he does as far as get, making, the grind, uh, making the game a little bit more gritty. So I'm not mad at, you know, uh, Coach Jenkins going with Steven Adams on, on some of these plays. Uh, you know, like I said, the reason why the Memphis Grizzlies are so good without Ja is because they are young and we are the NBA. We're in the current NBA state right now to where everything is floor space and movement. I'm telling you right now, and it's not no knock to Michael Jordan or anybody like that, but as much cigars as he smoked, do you think he really can go up and down the court at the rate and the pace of this, uh, of this NBA? because it's just a much faster game now. They cover a lot more floor space. Now, the NBA did play fast in the 70s. A lot of people overlooked the 70s because it wasn't just the best era. I still think the 80s uh, was kind of the golden and the best era over the 90s in basketball because the 90s, you did have a lot of expansion, uh, you know, within the league and six teams from 89 to 96. I mean, that's a lot of teams to add. Even Dennis Rodman, I can pull an article where Dennis Rodman said, we can beat anybody at this point because the, the league is so watered down. Like, he even said it. Uh, the great Dr. J said it. Magic, a lot of people said it. You said, oh, man, if we would have had this league in the 80s, it would have been over with because you had two great superstars on every team. You understand what I'm saying? In the 80s, look at the Celtics team. Look at those Lakers teams. Look at those 76ers teams. You understand what I'm saying? But now, in the 90s, you know, the talent was just spread out too much. Like, if you look at the Clyde Drexler, you know, being on Portland, uh, you know, one Hall of Famer, Phoenix Suns, or Charles Barkley, even though the talent was good, don't get me wrong, because Kevin Johnson was a hell of a player, and I do mean a hell of a player, and I think he may even be Hall of Fame worthy. It's just that he didn't, he hit his peak. He didn't hit it for long enough. That's all I'm saying. He didn't hit his peak for long enough. So, with all that being said, y'all, um, you know, I just feel like you know, Golden State is getting too far ahead of themselves. And Draymond Green, you want to irk the crowd like, oh, this ain't nothing and doing all of that. When you don't even, when you have to realize you got to go back, uh, you, you go, you're going to go back home and thinking that's just the end all be all. And that going back home is what's going to just automatically make you win and save you when that's not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, I just feel like Memphis has what it takes to pull the upset uh, at their home call it an upset. I won't even call it an upset because people forget Memphis is the two seed. They had a better regular season than Golden State. They ran through the league even with John missing all those games. So even with John missing out on all these games, I'm not going to just necessarily count uh, the Memphis Grizzlies out. I think it's going to be very interesting going down the stretch. Uh, and I cannot wait until Friday night. Uh, if it goes to a game seven, I might just have to be in the building for the grindhouse, we might just have to go live on YouTube for that one, y'all, because it's gonna be crazy, crazy. So I'm gonna go ahead and claim that right now. So I see y'all at game seven, you understand me, uh, for Memphis. And what I wanna say is, uh, as always, right on to the real. Much love to these haters. I'm up out. Peace.